It is being dubbed by China as the project of the century. Xi Jinping has kicked off his grand $1.4 trillion network of roads, railways, ports and airports spanning across over 60 countries. All of India's neighbours except Bhutan were in attendance in Beijing when the new Silk Route took shape. Even the US attended, by the way, after its initial reluctance. India was a major absentee. The new Silk Route stretches across Asia, Europe, Africa and the Asia-Pacific region. You can see a link to Kolkata in the map behind me, but this now is in doubt. India's refusal to attend the summit raises a few quick questions. Right at the top, is this a show of diplomatic strength or indeed isolation? Number two, is China's multi-billion dollar Pakistan bet a big worry for India? And that is the question we're going to be debating tonight. Number three, can India bank on the United States and Japan to take on China? And finally, where does this leave the India-China relationship? All of that and more coming up in the next 30 minutes. Joining us tonight, a panel of eminent experts, former diplomat KC Singh, Jaydev Ranade from the Center for China Analysis and Strategy, Brahma Chalani from the Center for Policy Research, and Suhasini Heather, the diplomatic editor at The Hindu. much for joining us, uh, Jade Branade. Since you're with me here in the studio, let me start by asking you the very first question. Is this a sign of diplomatic strength or uh, is this a symbol of India's isolation? Is the isolation question perhaps premature and exaggerated, at least at this point? I think it's a sign of India's confidence rather than strength. Uh, it's also uh, a clear indication that India will not brook violation of its sovereignty and territorial integrity. I think these messages are very clear. There's no question of isolation at the moment because I don't think the door has been shut on the One Belt, One Road. Mm. It depends on how China uh, decides to uh, proceed in the matter. They've said it's regrettable that India has chosen not to attend the summit. Absolutely, but they're also saying that, you know, uh, India has to join to make this a success. So I think there is a road open ahead for us to uh, negotiate, for us to see how uh, to sort things out. China as much. China has gone on record to say that the One Belt, One Road will be sensitive to the core interests of particip uh, participating countries and their national uh, concerns. So I think, uh, you know, there is a need for uh, China to address our concerns. Finally, if I may make just mm -hmm. one point, we are the only country whose sovereignty and territorial integrity has been violated. Yes. No other. Mm. So I don't think we can compare India's reaction with that of any other. Okay, Ambassador Singh, as uh, Jaydev Ranade pointed out, that the concerns that India has raised are legitimate and valid when it comes to the violation of territorial sovereignty. Uh, you know, at the heart of this issue really is uh, China's aspirations and the big several billion dollar bet on Pakistan with the CPEC. What should the strategy be going forward if, as Jaydev Ranade is pointing out, the road or the door is not shut on India wanting to be part of the OBOR, what should our strategy be from here on? Look, India has had a serious concern. I mean, sovereignty is one side. Other one is that it, this is this a reliving of what is called the Middle Heaven uh, Syndrome. Uh, where China is the center of a new spoken wheel uh, trade arrangement in the world, which is relaying the, uh, the corridors of trade created after mm. the Second World War, uh, we, where it is selectively picking everything, and it becomes the center, and there are spokes running all around India. Uh, but just to modify what Mr. Ranade said, there is a breach of sovereignty, even in the case of the South China nations abutting the South China Sea. Because there, China has been pushing mm. and challenging their sovereign, maritime sovereignty. But yes, uh, on the continental, uh, on, on, on land and the continent, it's really India uh, which has a question. Now, India has traditionally looked at east-west connectivity. And this is a north-south mm. connectivity being created by uh, China. And for us, perforce, that was compulsory because we, we have the Himalayas in the north. Uh, so India always had a concern. But the way China has gone about doing it, and then uh, mm. poked India in the eye with 
Masood Azhar, with various other things. So mm. India was put on the back foot. I think it was a diplomatic compulsion for us. Uh, and that is why India also pushed the corridor a little, pushed the framework a little by forcefully uh, reacting to what China, uh, uh, when China objected to Dalai Lama going to Arunachal and, uh, and, go, and, and, and let, letting uh, him carry forth with his program. And I think that was India's response, mm. uh, that if you don't show concern to uh, uh, our issues, then we'll also have to push it. Mm. But uh, it is true that uh, I think the, the element that India was probably not prepared for was that Trump will change the U.S. policy yeah. and go and do a deal yeah. with the Chinese, which appears to have happened, mm. and would actually go and attend, mm. and then even the Japanese will follow. So there, yes, there's a degree of isolation, but then when you're a rising power, you have to live with it. Uh, Brahma Chalani, let me uh, take the conversation forward and address the issues that were raised there by Ambassador Singh. The fact that India was perhaps banking on uh, Trump staying away from the One Belt, One Road Summit. Of course, the Americas decided to send a junior level delegation uh, to attend the summit in Japan as well. Uh, you know, is, is this, could this be seen at least as a setback in the interim for India? Not at all. First, you have to bear in mind that what Xi Jinping was trying to do was to host a summit, a summit, not a conference, not a forum, but a summit. How many heads of government did he get? They lobbied for months for heads of government to come. They only got 28 heads of government to attend this much hyped summit. And the Americans, the Japanese and others no doubt attended. At a pretty, the Americans attended at a pretty junior level. But we shouldn't be surprised by the fact that the Americans attended because President Trump is a tactical, transactional president. He believes in transactional dealings with other countries. And his attitude and policy and approach towards China has fundamentally changed in the period since he became the president. He is basically quoting China, and recently the Chinese made some modest concessions on the trade front to announce a 100-day deal. There are no major concessions the Chinese have made, but this 100-day trade plan, just for 100 days, we don't know what will come after that, that plan was much hyped by Washington, by the Trump administration. So we, we, we shouldn't be surprised by Trump's transactional approach towards China. Hmm. Okay, you're saying we shouldn't be surprised by Trump's transactional approach to China, and of course it, uh, it could hinge on the fact that American economic interests could benefit from the One Belt, One Road uh, uh, project as well. But Suhasini, Heather, uh, you know, where do we go from here? And we were just talking, uh, before we started the show, I was talking with Jaydev Ranade on, on the China-Pakistan economic corridor and what India could do about that. I mean, if you look at the reports that have come in uh, from Don, uh, 10 key areas identified for engagement. 17 specific projects identified a national fiber optic backbone, national logistics network to be built, warehousing and distribution, I mean, so on and so forth, over $46 billion in terms of proposed investment plan. How worried should India be and what should our response be? Well, Jireen, just to um, uh, put it clearly, the CPEC has not been announced just in the last few months. Uh, the China-Pakistan Economic sure. Corridor was announced in April of uh, 2015, so two years ago. Um, and, uh, it, uh, and while it is unfortunate, and I completely agree that it would be very difficult for India to join a project or even to sit on the sidelines when uh, such as uh, a sharp uh, challenge to its sovereignty is a part of the uh, Chinese map on the Belt and Road Initiative. I do think that there was space for diplomacy which seems to have been lost. Mm. In the last two years, mm. India could have worked with China uh, and China could have worked with India um, uh, to try and obviate mm. India's obvious concerns. Uh, there are several ways around mm. it. China is also working uh, on its uh, Belt and Road with, um, with Afghanistan, for example. So an alternate yeah. route could have been uh, solved where these projects that are part of India's uh, uh, claim uh, territory, these three or four projects in Gilgit, Baltistan, could have easily been given a different nomenclature. They didn't have to be part 
of the Belt and Road as we see it today. Um, mm. So I do think mm. that there was a window for diplomacy which has been lost by both sides. Uh, and uh, whether it can be opened again or not re really remains to be seen about whether they want to or not. Um, India's uh, claim mm. on sovereignty and its uh, objections to sovereignty are absolutely valid. I think some of the other concerns it has uh, expressed, you know, on the debt trap for its neighbors or whether it's on the environmental concerns mm. uh, or whether it is on China's hegemony. One has to remember there are 68 countries that are now part of the Belt and Road. 65% yes. of, uh, mm. of humanity mm. will be under this uh, particular project. So I'm not sure that India's concerns for others will be taken quite as seriously as India's concerns for its own sovereignty. Uh, good point that you made, Sahasi. And let me get uh, Mr. Ranade to respond to that. The space for diplomacy could have been exercised over the past two years because, as Sahasi rightly pointed out, the CPEC is not yesterday's development or even the development of the last six months. Uh, has that window of opportunity been lost by both sides? I agree with one part of what Sahasi said, which is that uh, China seems to have lost the window, and as as she said, have we? But let me make a couple of points here. Firstly. It's incorrect to say that we didn't raise the issue of the CPEC at the highest level. In mm. fact, when Modi went to Beijing in May 2015, he did raise it. He didn't get a satisfactory response. In fact, his um, you know, argument and his suggestions were snubbed. Uh, secondly, when uh, the um, Chinese decided to announce the CPEC, they chose to do it just three weeks before Modi's visit to Beijing. Mm. Obviously, to present him with a faith a comply and mm. not allow him mm. to uh, uh, bring up the issue. Thirdly, it's not just a question of sovereignty and territorial integrity. That is very important. But in addition, there are some very clear and definite indications in the CPEC of this being a military overture or a mm. military move mm. by China. Mm. In fact, it is uh, laying the groundwork for a potentially collusive military operation by China. Mm. And I point specifically to the secure fiber optic link being laid between Kashgar and Rawalpindi. Mm. Rawalpindi, mind you, not Islamabad. Mm. Which, and Kashgar is the headquarters of the South Xinjiang military district. Rawalpindi, the GHQ the, of, of Pakistan. Then the uh, road uh, linkages and China's interest in the northern area mm. abutting Xinjiang. Mm. And then the developments in and around Gwadar. So it's obvious that this is a military, uh, you know, it's going to have a military uh, need. Mm. And um, uh, in any case, as an economic uh, yeah. corridor, yeah. it's not viable because it's four times more expensive to get that. Mm. If you look at the power projects that are being built, again, uh, and I'm not going to uh, belabor the point that, you know, Pakistan will be under a burden, debt repayment burden. But the Pakistanis are raising that issue, so that's up to them. Mm. But as far as we are concerned, the military content is very important. Mm. And the way that they're linking up the Pakistan railway with, again, the South Xinjiang yeah. railway, yeah. these are matters of great concern. On that note, we're going to take a break, but when we return, we continue our conversation on the impact of the One Belt, One Road for India.